This morning, we're going to continue our conversation regarding the uh, church in Ephesus. Last week, we looked at the birth of the church as recorded by Luke in Acts chapter 9. And this week, we're going to fast forward something like 40, 50 years to a letter Jesus sends to the church in Ephesus. And what we're going to, to see is that though they started off strong, their faith, their work, their faithfulness had begun to wane. As I was thinking about uh, this, this, this passage, and this is silly, so just go with me for a moment. Uh, Some of you, like me, would probably spend Saturday mornings watching cartoons. And and without fail, there was always this Tootsie Roll uh, commercial. How many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll pop? Does anybody remember that? And the owl would go, one. Bob remembers it, two, three. And he would take a big old bite of it. Apparently, it's three licks to the center of a Tootsie Roll pop. The question that I have is, how long does it take for a church to become distracted? And, and the Bible gives us uh, a consistent answer through that. It usually just takes about a generation, 40 to 50 years. We see that in the book of Judges. After one generation, the people did what was right in their own eyes. And, and what we'll see for the church in Ephesus, it was about a generation, about a 50-year span of time, that they became distracted. They were committed to Jesus and the church, but they weren't devoted Their hearts were not full of the love that they initially had. And so what we're going to see is is Jesus' loving and corrective words to them and how they could reshape their present in order to honor God with their future and with their work. So with that in mind, go ahead and open up your Bibles, if you haven't already, to Revelation chapter 2. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 7. I'm reading out of the NIV today. And here are the words from Jesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them to be false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever hears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Jesus is writing to the believers in Ephesus, recognizing their present reality in order to reshape their future. And within this text, within these words, we, we hear Jesus pointing to the, to the good that these individuals are doing. Return to verse 2 with me. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them to be false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Jesus is highlighting three specific areas of of goodness within the church. First, their their work. They're they're an active group. As we we saw last week, the people that came to faith in Jesus Christ, their lives were so radically transformed that it impacted the religious and economic fervor of Ephesus. They began to love their husbands, began to be faithful to their wives. They began to pick up the children that were left in the streets to die and brought them into their own communities. The poor were looked after. They were a vibrant. They were still an active community and they were continuing on to do this hard work. Work that was, that brought them to, to, to uh, tire. They were tired and yet, despite their tiredness, they, they persevered through that work. This is a good thing. They were a church known for the truth. 
They understood the doctrines that, Tim, that Paul had taught Timothy and Timothy had taught the, the men of Ephesus and entrusted them and taught the congregations. They knew their Bible. They, they knew doctrine and they were resisting the work of the Judaizers. Men that would come into these communities and say, hey, it's great that you found Jesus. Now I want you to live like a Jew. Now if you're a guy, that means you're going to need to get circumcised. You're going to have to obey all these laws that are found within the Mosaic Covenant. You're going to have to do X, Y, and Z. Instead of just living for Jesus and being free like we sung. They resisted the, the teachings and the theories and the conspiracies of the day from outside of the community. Individuals that were coming from a pagan culture and said, hey, we like what you're doing. We see what you're doing. We, we want to come in and be a part of it. And we're going we're to teach this and we're going to teach that. And they would say, hold on. You are not teaching Jesus Christ crucified. Hold on. You're not teaching a love for God and a love for people and a desire to make disciples. You are teaching something other than this. And that is not welcome here. So they were known for their truth. Paul writes to Timothy in, in 1 Timothy. Pa Timothy was the, the pastor of the churches in Ephesus. So Paul writes to Timothy in this, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 and 5, I urge you when I went to, into Macedonia to stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculation rather than advancing the work of God, which is by faith. The goal of this command, Paul writes, is love, which comes from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and a sincere faith. The goal of truth and, and right doctrine is, is love. Number three, Jesus points out that they, they suffered for their faith. I mean, imagine this. You're, you're in a world that is absolutely antagonistic towards Jesus and the things of God. I'm sure we can't relate to that. We can because that's the world we live in today. They were ridiculed by society. They were ridiculed by friends. They were ridiculed by, by family. Christians were accused of being atheists, practicing incest, and they were cannibals. These were the rumors and the thoughts of the day. They were a monotheistic, they were a monotheistic religion devoted to a man that hung on a cross and died. This was ridiculous in the common culture. There's actual writings from uh, Roman historians accusing the Christian communities of, of practicing incest and, um, and, and, and being cannibals. And a lot of that was just because they, they didn't understand what was going on. That when we become brothers and sisters in Christ and we have a love feast and we celebrate the Eucharist, that these are profound, deeply spiritual meanings and that they bring honor to God. But... but they would take this half-truth and, and the people in the communities would, would twist it to try and bring a negative light onto the church. I'm sure we can't resonate with that in this day and age. Infancy was a common practice of the day. You had an unwanted child, a, a child that may have been before, uh, born with a, an infirmity, a deformity. Perhaps it was a girl and you wanted a boy and the common practice was within, you would just leave them outside on the road. And yet the church would come alongside these children, pick them up, and bring them into their home. And so it's weird, it's unthinkable that the broader culture would think that we would mistreat children. Now at the point of the text, the, the reader is like, all right, we're getting some high praise from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're doing good things. We're working hard. We're, we're striving to serve the community around us. We're, we're standing for truth. And for that, we're suffering. And yet Jesus brings a rebuke in order to reshape their future. Return back to verse 4. Yet, but, however, I hold this against you. 
You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did first. And if you don't repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. This rebuke that Jesus brings to the people of Ephesus comes in, in really three C's, right? The first C is this, this great concern. You have forgotten your first love. And as we saw last week, that that first love was, was Jesus. That, that first love was that, that kingdom of God, his, his rule and his reign. But they were still doing this work. And yet Jesus says, you've forgotten your first love. So what do we, what do we make of that? Well, pastors and theologians, commentators, all kind of agree that they were doing it out of a, a, of a commitment to, to the tradition. They were, they were doing it because, well, this is what Christians are supposed to do. And that sounds okay. But Jesus is coming and saying, that's not okay. If what you do in my name is not birthed out of love for me, it's not okay. We see this elsewhere. We, 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 we see it in that passage from 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3, right? Or for, uh, uh, chapter 1, verses 3 and 5, where, where Paul's instructing uh, 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 Timothy to say that, that this command is, is out of love. But Paul gives us a, a greater, a clearer uh, uh, explanation of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. You're very, if you've been to a wedding, you, you're familiar with this, right? But this is what Paul says of, of activity done out of commitment. Uh, uh, activity done, well, this is what Christians do, so this is what I do. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gifts of prophecy and can fathom all mystery and all knowledge, and, I, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all that I possess to the poor and give my body to the hardship that I may boast, but do not have, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Tongues, a work of the church. Prophecy, truth of the church. Giving, striving, sacrificing, laying my life out on the line. If I do any of these things without love, I gain nothing. The, the work is meaningless, and this is what Jesus is getting at. People of Ephesus, you are, you are committed, and that is good. That is wonderful. In many ways, it brings glory to his name. But I want is your devotion. What I want is your heart. What I want is your love because I love you. And I think that was hard for the people in Ephesus to hear. So there's that concern that Jesus brings. In this verse, there's also another C, a, a correction. Repent and remember the heart of God. That, that correction is, is to repent and to remember. And, and I know that we're very familiar with the idea and the activity of, of repentance, that it's very simply turning away from sin and, and turning to God. But the, the term here that, that is translated consider or, or remember in some texts isn't just a, a simple mental assent of like, you know what, I see the truth in it. I'm going to change my ways. That is, that is good and wonderful and right and proper. But what Jesus is bringing to our mind and, and to the minds of the people in Ephesus is a deep period of introspection so that the individual feel the weight of God's grace. They will feel the cost of that forgiveness. They will look to something like the cross and not just see it as an old rugged symbol of our faith, but they would see the blood-stained instrument 
that took the life of our Lord and Savior, stained with the sin of the world, and that we would know that God's love for us is deep and weighty and wonderful because He's willing to go to that extent in order to bring you and I and the people of Ephesus into a relationship with Him. Come taste and see that the Lord is good. So the correction isn't just a, okay, I want you to acknowledge that this is wrong and then change your ways. No, I want you to spend some time I want you to remember and reflect on what it was like when you first experienced the weight of that sin being taken off of your shoulders and knowing the freedom and the newness of life. I want you to remember the fervor which brought you out into the community where you couldn't help but share the gospel because this was the greatest news you had ever experienced. This was the greatest relief that you had ever experienced. This was the greatest thing to ever come into your life and you you couldn't wait to tell someone about it. Is your love for God producing that kind of response in your heart? Or like the believers in Ephesus, are we committed to the task of the work? It's a good thing to be committed to. Are we committed to upholding the truth of the Bible and of the gospel? Are we persevering? But we don't have that love. I wrote briefly about this in, my, in, my, in the email that went out this week, that I, I love the way that the Bible is written because it invites every believer into this authentic, transparent life. It, Jesus is pulling back the curtain and, and revealing our, the warts and, and everything and saying, this is, this is what I will work with. This is what I can work with. This is what I came to work with. But I think the one thing that prevents us from remembering that love is, is we're, we're a little shy of, of looking at our own warts. We're a little hesitant to, to bring that to the table. We, we would rather work at, at, at doing something. We would, we would rather stand up for a, a truth. We would even rather put our lives on the line and our livelihood on the line facing the, the ridicule and the scorn of society than coming before Jesus and remembering the weight of His love and the glory of His grace. And in this difficult message to the church in Ephesus, he, he gave us a, a, a concern and a, and a, <clears throat> and a correction, and, and he brings a, a consequence, saying, this is where you are today. You are committed to me, but you're not devoted to me. And if you don't take this seriously, if you don't work at this, if we don't do some of this, this business, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to remove my light I'm going to remove my presence. But at the end, and this is what I want you to hear, and this is what I want you to hold on to, there's this hope of restoration. Those that hear my words and obey them, I will give them the right to eat from the tree of life which is in heaven. This is what I love about Jesus, right? And the transparency and the authenticity that he invites us into. It's like, listen, I'm going to look at your warts. I'm going to deal with your warts. But I'm always going to give you hope. I'm always going to offer redemption. I'm always going to offer reconciliation. I'm always working to restore our relationship. Because I love you. And I want you to know that love. Because you are my children. And I've set you apart so that you can share that love with the world. Yes, he expresses his concern for his church. Yes, he offers a correction. And, and like a child, that's sometimes hard to hear, hear. And he's honest with us. And he says, this will be the consequence if you don't alter your behavior. But here's the hope. Here's the joy. Here's the good consequence if you do. So now we 
as a church, as individuals, we, we have to wrestle with this passage. Because this is not an isolated occurrence. You look at church history. You look at the history of our church. Prior to, to Pastor David, many of you have communicated to me that really Candy Congregational Church was nothing more than a country club. And people came and they encouraged one another and they, and they loved one another, but there was really no gospel presence. There was really no concern for widows or orphans, the poor. There wasn't much concern for, for children. There certainly wasn't much concern for biblical truth. We were, we were part of a, the UCC. And yet it was this church that stood for biblical truth. An aside, I, uh, when, I, when I came here, I, I, I didn't realize the importance of that heritage. Like, it hadn't really been communicated to me. But I want to tell you something particularly those that have been here for a long time. I run into pastors all the time. All the time. And more often than not, they're like, Candy Congregational Church, is that Biblical Witness Fellowship? Is that Pastor David running barefoot? I'm like, yeah. Oh, I got to tell you, that was such a ministry to my soul as I was fighting and trying to stand for biblical truth, knowing that this church in Candia and their, and their pastor and their, and their people were fighting against the, the onslaught of what the culture and the world was bringing. So I just, as an aside, I, I, I want you to hear that, that I've, like, continually, it's a, impressed upon me the, the rich heritage, the work that God has done in this church through men and women who are devoted to his name, who love him. And that's why I'm so hopeful. That's why I love being this, this church's this pastor because I know we come to a text like this and we say, you know what? I'm going to go for the hopeful consequence. I'm going to walk out of the sanctuary on a Sunday and I'm going to go home and I'm going to think deeply on this truth. And I'm going to come before God and say, God, I know I'm a human. And I know I have warts. So I know, just like the people in Ephesus, there's probably a part of my life where I'm committed to you and not devoted to you. There's probably aspects of my faith, aspects of my walk, where I'm working hard and striving hard because that's what good Christians do. I'm giving because that's what good Christians do. I'm standing up for biblical truth because that's what good Christians do. I'm laying my life on the line because that's what good Christians do. But Lord, I want to be devoted to you. I want to remember what it was first like to stand before your presence and know how deeply loved I am. I want to stand before a cross and not have it just simply be white noise because I see it all the time, but be reminded of the lengths you went to to love me, a sinner. That you would leave glory in order to save me, a sinner. I want to give us a few moments to just do some business with God. I want you to, maybe something that we've reflected on, the, the different distinction between commitment or, or, and devotion, or, or perhaps as we were going over Jesus' rebuke, it kind of it unsettles your heart. Maybe you had a positive reaction to it. Maybe you had a negative reaction. I don't know. Maybe you're like, uh, I don't know. But whatever it is, I'm sure because the God of our universe works and we don't come to just listen but we come to interact so for the next minute or two i know sometimes these are silent and they're awkward but for the next minute or two just interact with god and what he's doing in your soul and your spirit right now listen for his voice and if you have a pen and a paper or a tablet or a smartphone take a note of what he's pressing upon your heart that's something important right there. Let's pray for a moment and then we'll kind of return to our passage to see how we can uh, help apply this to our lives and, and, and help ensure that we don't walk in the same way that the Ephesians did. Father God, I want to say thank you again. I want to say thank you for the love that you have demonstrated to us. I want to say thank you for the cross that stands behind me as a constant reminder of the length that you went 
to save me, to save us, to save the world's sinners. Men and women who until confronted with your love were just happy to be running in a 180 degree direction away from you. Lord, I confess that I would rather work hard. I would rather have deep theological conversations about this doctrine and the other thing. And that I would rather suffer the insults of society than sometimes do the the work of the soul, what you're drawing us to today. So even in my own weakness, I ask that you would break through that. I ask that you would break through that in the men and the women gathered here today. Come, Lord, and lead us into renewal and restoration of our love for you. Amen. Thank you for participating in that. So what do we do? How do we move forward? How do we enter into a a pattern of life and relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus that helps protect us, our others, and our our loved ones from uh, shifting or sidestepping into a committed relationship versus a a devoted relationship? And and, and first and foremost, and we kind of hinted at this as we were in this moment of prayer, is we just have to realize that what was true then is true today. Churches across the world fall into this pattern. And the perception of society is that that Christians know more about their sexual ethic than they know about who Jesus is. Last week, I I shared some startling statistics from Ligonier's ministry, the state of theology, right, where we saw that um, uh, many evangelicals, evangelicals, and, and a good definition of evangelicals are unclear about who Jesus is, that he was a good teacher but not God, that he was a created being, right? Like that's heresy, right? And if that's your belief about Jesus, then I want to have a question and answer time with you because you might not be saved if that's who you think Jesus is. So come and see me or Jeff or Richard or one, just come and talk to us, please. We realize that this is the state of the world today and the state of the church today, that believers are more clear about a sexual ethic than they are about who Jesus is, right? Here's, the, here's continuing from that, that survey from Ligonier Ministries. Jesus is the first and greatest created being by God. 73% of evangelicals agree with that statement. Created being. Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. 43% of evangelicals will agree with that statement. People are good by nature. 57% agree with that statement. People born innocent. Evangelicals, 65% of evangelicals surveyed would believe in that statement, agree with that statement. 94% of evangelicals would agree with the statement that sex outside of marriage is a sin. 91% of evangelicals would agree that abortion is a sin. These are all true statements, and we should affirm them, and we should applaud that this level of truth is, is consistent. But we should be worried about the other statistics. That's the world. That's the, that's the state of the church, is that the, the secondary matters of faith, and, and hear that, sexual issues are a secondary matter of faith in God's kingdom. The primary issue is salvation. And the perception from the outside world is that the church today is more concerned about those secondary tier issues of doctrine and theology 
And they really are about the, uh, the most important thing, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, I know that we know that's not to be true. I know that in our heart of hearts, the thing that is most important to us and that's pressed upon us every Sunday and on every page of the Bible is that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior and that he came to save the lost. But if the perception of the world is reality, then we have some work to do. Right? And what that means is that we have to accept our corporate responsibility of Christians belonging to the capital C Church. And though we may have a right understanding, and though we may speak better than most about who Jesus is and, and the importance of a, a good sexual ethic, many of our brothers and sisters don't. And because of that, the name of Jesus has been diminished. And so what can we do? Well, I believe the same, uh, 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 the same that what Jesus gave to the church of Ephesus is helpful for us. We pray and we lament for the sins of the capital C church. We come before God and say, God, we have diminished your name. We have have taken away from your glory. We have become distracted by, yes, important matters, but matters that fall second to the name of Jesus Christ and him crucified. Lord, help us to correct this in our world. Just as this church has this, has this wonderful, rich heritage of, of standing for biblical truth within the Christian world, let us stand for Jesus in the secular world, allowing our, our, our doctrine and our theology and our, and our biblical truth not to build fences and say, this is why we're separate from you, but to be a bridge into the communities around us. This is why Paul writes to Timothy, I, I, I need you to, to, to move people away from false doctrine and conspiracies and endless genealogies, and I, I need you to move them to sound doctrine, biblical truth. And this command, the aim of this command is, is love in order to build that bridge into those secular communities. Now, that in and of itself and how you do that is a sermon for another day and we're going to get to that in about two weeks weeks from now like this generation is crying out for justice your generation my generation we cried out for truth this generation is crying out for justice and so you'll hear terms like diversity and equity and inclusion and justice But what we're going to find out in a couple of weeks is that those things that they are striving for, dying for, are found in Christ. They're found within His church. Now, they might not like how it's found in His Christ and in His church, and so we're going to talk about how we bring them from point A to point Z. But it's important that our stance for biblical theology Our love for doctrine isn't fence building, but bridge building. And that's that's something that I think the church needs to realize and repent of. Number two, individually speaking, you and I, we have to come back to the joy of our salvation. We have to come back to that moment, those moments in our lives, in our walk with Jesus, where we knew how richly loved we were. C.S. Lewis writes that God offers us this banquet, this feast, this Thanksgiving dinner. That's coming up, right? Roasted turkey, smoked turkey, deep fried turkey, Sweet potato pie, pumpkin pie, yams, dressing, gravy, the fixins. Oh, can't wait. That's what he offers us through his love. And yet what C.S. Lewis observes and writes, 
We would rather sit in the dirt and make mud pies than join Jesus at his banquet feast. Think about that. I think that's a beautiful illustration of what Jesus is getting at. You have forgotten your first love. You have forgotten what it's like to sup, to dine with the creator of everything seen and unseen. Come back to his table. We reset our priority. We reset our priority to Jesus and the gospel. To Jesus and the gospel. Everything we do, every aspect of our life is about communicating Jesus and the gospel. In four weeks' time, we're going to look at Ephesians 5 and one of the great ministry, well, it isn't a great ministry, but what uh, Paul talks about as being a profound ministry, mystery, marriage. And how that understanding that properly that text and that profound minis- mis- <laughs> thank you mystery has a tremendous impact on the way and how we can communicate the gospel i'm really looking forward to that weekend because it's a, it's just a different it's a it's a better take on marriage so just to kind of prime the pump there maybe whet your appetite go i wonder what he's going to talk about But it brings the notion that everything we do, all that we are about, how we work, how we live in community with our neighbors, what we say, our humor, right? What we write about, what we post about, all of it is in an effort to share the love of Jesus Christ with the people of Candia, the surrounding communities, and to the ends of the world. That should be our priority as Christians. That is the natural priority of someone whose heart is devoted to Jesus. It's a struggle when your heart is committed or your mind is committed to Jesus. So we reset our priorities. The next several weeks, we're going to be going through chunks of Ephesians. Paul uses this word mis- mystery six times and kind of hangs the structure of Ephesians on this idea of mystery and, the, and how Jesus reveals and pulls back the curtain so that you and I can understand it. Because here's the thing that I want you to understand as we move through the book of Ephesians is that the world looks into the church and it is still a mystery. And because of that mystery, there's misconceptions and there's confusion. Much like during the first century when the Romans thought we were a bunch of atheists who ate one another and abused children. But the clearer that we can be in understanding the mystery that is being revealed through Jesus Christ and the Scriptures, the better equipped you and I will be to share the glorious goodness of God's love with the people closest to us and the people farthest away from us. I'm really looking forward to this journey with